This is James, James Governor from Red Monk, uh, and we're here to do another What Is How To, and our special guest today is Starbucks Man, aka Josh Long, aka Starbucks Man, and uh, he knows apparently something about microservices and all of that goodness, but today we're here to talk about what is a cloud-native system. So who are you, Josh, and what is a cloud-native system? Hi, James. Good to see you again. I'm a uh, Spring developer advocate on the Spring team at Pivotal. I've been uh, the, the most prolific, most visible, most highly acclaimed contributor of bugs across all the different projects that I've contributed to in the last going on eight plus years now. Uh, and uh, a cloud native system is one that is optimized for the continuous and safe evolution of applications and you know in software, right? And it's one that's optimized for delivery, okay. right? And that's what we care about. So it has four characteristics that I've seen common across the cloud native systems that I've, that I've looked at, and I'm sure you've you've recognized the same. A uh, cloud native system is one that is agile. That is to say, each of the individual pieces is small, and it's easy to change, easy to evolve. It's elastic. It takes advantage of cloud computing, which is self-service, which gives you also speed. Uh, it's robust. Uh, you know, it does the right thing in the face of service outages and topology changes, uh, which is a natural side effect of introducing the distribution that allows microservices. Uh, and uh, it's observable. You can see what's happening both at the node level and at the system level. Right. So we're going to. You know, I would like to show you an application. I would like to show you. Uh, some software that actually takes advantage of these characteristics or that demonstrates this characteristic. That is awesome. But what I want to know is, what is the difference between a cloud-native system and a cloud-native application? I'm always hearing about 12-factor apps. Do we need a completely new way of building apps? Is this for, like, stateless apps? Or when you talk about a cloud-native system, is it any kind of apps? What's the difference between a cloud-native system and a cloud-native application? I, I suppose a cloud-native application, when I say cloud-native, I'm talking about something that is optimized for agility. It's optimized for delivering value quickly. So could you build a, a giant monolithic application and still call it cloud native? No. But could you build a monolith that is optimized for small changes? Yeah, why not, right? There's a lot of organizations doing that. There's so. a lot to be said for monoliths for quick product market fit. You don't want to prematurely optimize. But what you do want to do is get to the demo as quickly as possible. So that's what is a cloud native yes. system. Why don't you show me what you can do and ah. how to do something with a cloud native system. So we've got a typical, uh, just a REST API. It's just a nonsense retrieval REST API with reservation data, a record of type reservation in the database. It's got hypermedia links. It's got data. It's not all that interesting. But what we want to do is uh, to interact with it. And so we've got a REST API. It's observable, right? We talked about observability as being one of the key requirements. Uh, th this is supported by the actuator. The actuator is a framework inside of Spring Boot that, that surfaces information about the application, things like the, the uh, in metrics here, the uh, health indicator, the uh, environment information, all that kind of stuff that's here. And what I want to do is I want to build an application to talk to it. So I'm going to build a new application from scratch, from whole cloth here on start.spring.io. And it's going to be an edge service. And, and the, web, the edge service is going to build be a web application. So we're going to use the web support. It'll talk to our centralized configuration server called the config server. So we'll bring in the config client. It'll take advantage of service registration and discovery. So we'll bring in the Eureka dependency for uh, our you know, discovery client abstraction. It'll use Zipkin for distributed tracing. Uh, it'll use Hystrix for the circuit breaker. Uh, and it'll use Fain for declarative REST APIs. Oh, and of course, Actuator, right? So we've got all that. Now, and then I'm going to bring in the Lombok compile time annotation processor, which makes short work of the generation of getters and setters and all that, all that kind of stuff. So I'll hit generate. And so is, is, some of the, is some of the agility here, from your perspective, the is it that, that the, 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 the fact that these uh, interdependencies and stuff are managed so that the the you don't have to do all the configuration is that part of the yes, sir. is it is is that part of the agility that you think about in a in a cloud native system absolutely the 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 fast the time between having an idea and being able to express it that's super important i don't want to spend time configuring my build and and you know writing all the boilerplate and integrating different java libraries and so on spring boot uh, is what underpins all the stuff that we're talking about today and of course it's a rich ecosystem represented here by these beautiful glorious checkboxes Okay, so lots and lots of stuff, yeah. you know, managed so the developer doesn't need to worry about it. Right, and that makes it so that, you know, even I can do interesting things. So here we go. I've got an application. 
uh, it's going to be a client. And we're not just building any kind of client. We're building something called an edge service. This is the first port of call for requests coming in from the outside from actual clients, from iPhones, from PlayStations, from HTML5 browsers, from Xboxes, from uh, you know Android devices, whatever. Each client has client-specific concerns. And rather than retrofit every single existing microservice to accommodate that new client, uh, just change uh, those, you know, centralize those concerns here at the edge. So we want this edge service to draw its configuration from the config server. The uh, config server is running in the background here it's on port 8888. And in order for it to vend configuration values, things like keys and values and properties and locators and passwords and whatever, uh, we need to give it a, a name so that it can find mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, we need to give our service a name so that it identifies itself to the, uh, to the config server. Uh, and then we need to also take advantage of service registration and discovery. So we want to make it easy for our service to be, uh, to be discovered, to advertise its presence so that other services can find it. And we also want to be able to talk to other services that are advertising themselves as well, right? Uh, this is particularly useful when you're building a distributed system uh, and uh, you, know, you want to be able to ask questions about the state of the system. Where does that, where does that service live? DNS is, a, is mm -hmm. a choice, I suppose, but it's not a great choice uh, because it doesn't give you the ability to ask questions about the state of the system. It only tells you where the service lives, not if it's necessarily there, right? So this abstraction is enabled by using the discovery client abstraction. And uh, with that, we can run this application. There we go. And that should spin up, and it'll take, uh, it'll, it'll register itself in the registry. And the registry is over here on 8761. There's three other things already written here and already running and registered, and they're advertising themselves. Uh, and it'll draw its configuration from the config server, you know, identifying itself as the reservation hyphen client and going to the config server where it'll see the keys from reservation hyphen client properties and from application properties. Now, the config server and the service registry that I'm running, which is Eureka, these are undifferentiated heavy lifting. These are things that you need to do to, to solve distributed systems problems, but they're not particularly useful. They're not, uh, you know, they're not the... Um, Kind of stuff that I want to spend too much time doing. So if you're using a, a platform like Cloud Foundry, these are just turnkey things. You just CF create service, you make a service, and then you can bind it to your application. Uh, and we're using Spring Cloud here. It makes it easy to get a demo version of these up and running fairly quickly as well. So now if we go to Eureka, refresh, and you can see the client is there now. So it's clearly able to participate in service registration and discovery. Let's build an endpoint, an you know, adapter API, just a trivial API that um, sends back the uh, the names, just the names, right? So the names that we had in the reservation API. So localhost 8000 forward slash reservations. I want to just keep Rita and Josh and James, and I want to discard the rest of that. So I'm going to create a REST endpoint here, and I'm going to map this to forward slash reservations. I'm going to create an endpoint called names, and it's just going to return the names I'm going to do some basic transformation in order to get that, right? Because that's what we're doing is we're going to call the downstream REST service. We're going to make an HTTP call to the service. We're going to look up where the service lives using the service registry. And we could use the Spring Framework REST template. The REST template uh, is a HTTP workhorse, workhorse client, and certainly that's an option. But I don't want to spend too much time writing HTTP clients. So instead, I'll use Fane. I'll say reservation client. And this is a, a, um, a declarative way to build a client based on convention. I'm going to describe an interface, and the interface mm -hmm. is going to um, have methods that will then correspond to endpoints that I want to call on the service. And the service, of course, is the service that's identified as, as a reservation service in the registry. So it's that, that this annotation here, this bit here, says go to the registry, find one instance of the potentially innumer you know, innumerable many instances of this particular service, get the IP, make the request, and the request, the nature of the request will be described by annotating this this method invocation. So get forward slash reservations. And when we get the JSON, we're going to take it and turn it back into a envelope object called a resource. And the payload is a reservation. And the um, the payload in the, you know, the reservation itself, we only care about the name, after all. So And is this where we're getting some of our elasticity from? I mean, that was one of the characteristics you talked about. W what is the value of Fane client in that perspective? Well, Fane makes it easy for us to, um, to to declaratively create clients, it's going to do client-side load balancing. And that's not unique or specific to Fane, uh, but it is certainly uh, you know, very, very useful. right? So um, that's, that's one thing that can do it. But it's not the only thing. You can also use the REST template. And it can do client-side load balancing as well. You can make the decision 
right. about uh, which node to call on the client, you know, using a number of different technologies, and it's integrated for you conveniently, right? So resource, we are a resource of hypermedia. There we are. So all we're saying is take the JSON, convert it into an envelope object of type reservation uh, or of type resource that has a payload called reservation, and now we can use that client in our code. So we say private final reservation client. Okay, and we're just going to inject this client into our constructor here. And this is going to make it so that we can call that service. And again, the client will do the load balancing. It'll make it, we're going to get the JSON back. It's going to be turned into a, 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 an object that we can then now map. And uh, we can dereference the reservation name field into a list. And that's going to work fine in the happy path. But suppose something goes wrong, right? When we call the downstream service and it's not there, it's going to throw a big fat exception. So we're going to use a circuit breaker here, right? And the circuit breaker is going to allow us to design a fallback method that gets invoked when something goes wrong, if there should be a um, if there should be an exception of some sort that's thrown uh, in in the uh, body of this method, right? So, you know, a lot of search, a lot of websites will do this. They'll say, "Oh, well, you called the search engine service, but the search engine service isn't available right now. Here are some machine learned recommendations from across the web. It's not it's not exactly what you wanted, but it's better than a you know a status code error or something like that." Well, arguably, exception. graceful degradation is also a characteristic. It's a characteristic of a cloud native app, if not a cloud native system. You got it. Both. Yes, absolutely. So I'm going to enable these characters, these qualities, by uh, uh, using these checkboxes here. And I'll restart the application. Uh, and there we go. So then now we have a client that's going to talk to the downstream service. And uh, uh, that service will, you know, it's restarted it. So it's not available in the registry net right now. Uh, if we uh, give it a tick, here we go. It's re re registered in the registry again. Now we go back to our edge service localhost reservations names. There is the data in our edge service. It's working fine. Now if I want to, you know, I want to prove that the circuit breaker... Break breakers... it, Josh. Break it. You need to break it. Well, I'll break it. Okay. Before we do that, before we break it, let me uh, demonstrate some observability here, right? What I want to make, make sure we understand what's happening here. That circuit breaker is uh, guarding the, the flow of data between our client to the downstream service. Mm -hmm. That circuit breaker is a great place to monitor the state of this particular system, right? There's emergent behavior uh, implied in the sort of uh, message passing from the client to the service. If I can't instrument the downstream service, I can at least observe the circuit breaker itself. And if the circuit breaker says that it's open and thus that traffic isn't going through, then I can use that as a proxy for instrumenting and monitoring some downstream service over which I, over which I have no control. And I can use, I can visualize all that that uh, that state using a circuit breaker dashboard. Yet another thing that I don't want to have to run and maintain myself, but that you can easily stand up if you have something like. Spring Cloud Stream, uh, sorry, Spring Cloud um, Histrix, right? So I'm going to put that here, localhost, reservation name. So as I make requests on the left, you see everything's fine, everything's fine on the right, right? There's, there's the uh, moving average trending ever upwards on the right. It says 24, et cetera. So now let's go kill that downstream service, the reservation service, the actual thing to which we're making requests. That's running here, I think, in the background, is it? Yep, there we are. So as I, uh, as I kill it, now I go back to the browser and hit refresh, and you can see that it's now saying that 100% of the requests are not going through. For those of you who are colorblind, I'm sorry that the uh, colors here aren't great. This is red. It's showing us that it's not actually uh, working, right? The, the communication isn't working. So that gives me, a, at a glance, present status, right? And the other way to get that visibility is to use distributed tracing. So I like the circuit breaker if, you know, to introduce resi resilience in my code, but also to uh, to uh, observe systems over which I have no control. Distributed tracing, on the other hand, is great for services over which I have uh, control. If I have control of the whole, over the whole system, then I can instrument everything with distributed tracing. And Spring Cloud uh, supports distributed tracing thanks to something called Spring Cloud Sleuth. Uh, Sleuth right? We have, an, app, we have an, app, uh, an implementation of that, that abstraction that supports Twitter's open Zipkin. And I happen to have Zipkin here in the background. And Zipkin is aware of the different services in the in the topology here, right? So client and service, and I can see different endpoints that have been invoked. I can say I want to see all the calls that have gone to the reservations endpoint, and I can see here that these requests have, uh, you know, gone through. Hit find trace, and I can see the the sort of waterfall graph of the request the requests that have gone through that system, right? So. If I click on each waterfall graph element, I can see the sort of request log and the context about the request, etc. So this supports the present status, uh, you know, the the uh, immediate at a glance visibility, and I can see the flow of messages from one node to another to another to another. 
Uh, to do that yourself, you'd have to instrument every request, every ingress and egress point in the application. So this kind of stuff supports observability at, at, you know, in the system, right? Uh, we're distinguishing uh, the, the, the behavior of one node from the behavior of the system itself. And people forget about the system. They look, they look at their architecture diagram and they think, that is my system. Well, well, that's nonsense. The architecture diagram is no more your system than Google Maps is your city, right? So we looked at building an uh, elastic application that's meant to live in the cloud. It's meant to scale out. Uh, it's robust. We looked at uh, reliability patterns like the circuit breaker. We looked at things like uh, centralized configurations to support reloadable configuration, security, uh, journaling, and auditing. Uh, we've looked at um, how to build an application quickly using Spring Boot and, and the uh, sort of dependencies and that ease of configuration. Uh, and then we looked at um, uh, observability at the system system uh, level and the node level. So I think this kind of speaks to the four points I was talking about earlier. Great. Well, that is what is and how to. Thanks very much, Josh. Thank you very much. For more, check out Start That Spring Rail.